Hi, everyone. My name is Courtney Waring, Director of Education at the Eric Carle Museum of Picture Book Art. And thank you for joining us for our conversation with Warren Binford and Juju Morales. First, we'd love to hear from you. And I already see that you're using the chat. Continue, that's wonderful. Feel free to use the chat button to say hello and let us know where you're connecting from. I'd like to thank the Carl's members and donors. Your contributions make our work possible. Uh, thanks to the Patricia Morrison McDonald Endowment Fund for supporting our education programming and the Massachusetts Cultural Council for their operational support. Um, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions during the program, we're, we're dedicating time at the end for Warren and Juji to answer any questions you may have. And in the off chance we experience any technical difficulties and get cut off, we thank you in advance for your patience. We'll try to get back online as soon as possible. Uh, and you can use the link shared in your Zoom reminder to reconnect with us. This program is being recorded. So if you miss any portion or you'd like to share with a friend, we should have a captioned recording of this program on the Carl's YouTube page in a week or so. And now to our program. We're, we're so grateful for Warren Binford and Juji Morales for coming together today as they talk about Hear My Voice, Escucha Mi Voz, a new book that shares the stories of 61 children in their own words from actual sworn testimonies of their experiences in detention at the Southern US border. Their experiences have been illustrated by 17 Latinx artists, including Caldecott medalist and multiple Pura Bell Prey Illustrator Award winner, Juji Morales. And these testimonies have been assembled by Warren Binford, an internationally recognized children's rights scholar, director of the clinical law program at Willamette University, and founder of Project Amplify, a national campaign launched to establish protections, legal protections for children in government care. Warren, I will hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Courtney, and thank you everyone for sharing where you're from. It's so wonderful to see so much support for these children from coast to coast. When we first started this project, it was truly our hope that we would be able to amplify these children's voices, you know, from California, the Northwest, across the Midwest, and, you know, of course, the Rocky Mountains, the Southwest, and the Southeast, the Northeast, and I'm seeing all of these um, places on there, as well as seeing people calling in from uh, South America. So thank you, thank you, thank you for taking the time to hear these children's stories. Um, Juji and I had a chance to talk last week about today and, and how we wanted to spend the hour with you. And what we'd like to propose is that I can spend about 20 minutes giving you a little bit of background about how this project came to be and then Juji and I can have a little bit of a conversation one-on-one, -on -one, and then we'd like to invite you to grow that conversation and expand it to include all of you. So if there are certain things that you wanna talk about as you're uh, watching the presentation or listening to the one-on-one -on -one conversation that Juji and I have, please feel free to, to comment in the chat box that is being monitored. So let me tell you a little bit how uh, Hear My Voice came to happen. Um, a few years ago in 2017, I was asked to go down to uh, the uh, U.S. southern border uh, to interview children who were being detained there um, with their families in a family detention center. And, um, and during that trip, uh, I was supposed to inspect the facility, interview the children and the parents and determine whether or not their rights were, were being respected. And I found that on a systematic basis, they were being violated in, in many instances. And then I was asked to go back again a few months later. And during that visit, while I was there looking at 800 empty beds, uh, the Trump administration attorneys were in federal court telling the judge point blank that there were no beds for these children. There was nowhere to put them and that they needed to house these children in abandoned military bases around the country. And I literally was looking at the empty beds and I realized that what well, the court was being told, what the American people were being told was simply not true. Uh, I also noticed that the conditions in that facility had grown much worse just in the few months since I had been last there. And in fact, uh, we later learned, the American public later learned that a little girl died shortly after she left that facility. And um, she was the first of seven children to die in subsequent months. Um, over the course of the next couple of years, I continued to visit facilities in, in Texas and New Mexico and California, and it seemed that each was worse than the previous one, 
until finally we came to this border patrol facility, the Clint Border Patrol facility in June, 2019. And that's where um, this journey really begins, the journey of how Hear My Voice came into being. What happened is that this is not for some reason moving forward. So I apologize, let me try another approach. There we go. Um, what basically happened is that if you look back over historical numbers, you'll see that it wasn't um, uncommon for the United States to have over a, a million people um, being apprehended um, at the, the U.S. borders um, over the last several decades. And so the numbers going into those first visits um, in 2017, 2018, they weren't that high, relatively speaking. As a matter of fact, it was some of the lowest levels of migration that we had ever seen in modern history. And yet the narrative that we were hearing was very panicked. It was that, you know, there were criminals who were invading the United States that we needed to protect, you know, our, our, our families and our communities from these criminals. And, and the fact is, is that uh, immigration was relatively low. However, there was a crisis that was growing and that crisis is represented in that green bar um, at the end. And what you see is that over the last 10 years, we've seen an increase in children being part of the demographics arriving to the United States. And despite the fact that we, we saw this coming and that the numbers continued to grow and the circumstances that were driving children to the United States were not changing, we did not change our border management policies to, um, you know, support children and care for them in ways that they were appropriate, you know, to the opposite. We actually started to criminalize the children. Um, when we look at who these children are, we see that many of the children are coming from the Northern Triangle. Uh, I've also interviewed children from Eastern Europe and from um, Central Asia and from South America, but the, the overwhelming majority of the children that we're seeing at the Southern border are coming from four countries, um, the Mexico and the Northern Triangle countries of El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. And um, if there's one country that's been the largest source country over the last couple of years, it, it's been Guatemala for a variety of reasons. Um, you'll see that the Northern Triangle isn't really that far from us at all. It's about 1,600 miles, depending on what country the children are, are coming from. And in fact, um, the Obama administration had implemented a new program, which is called the Central American Minors Program, that would allow children to apply for asylum in their home, com home countries. And if they had immediate family members in the United States, such as the US, um, it was such as you know, parents or brothers or sisters, that um, the, the family could arrange for the children to be flown to the United States while their asylum claims were being heard by the courts. And this allowed children to uh, avoid what is um, a, a, a relatively short, you know, 1600 miles, you know, the kids could fly there in just a few hours. Um, but when they're going on foot or by land, it's actually several days and it's a very dangerous journey. Um, approximately two thirds of the females who make this journey um, report sexual assault. Um, when they get to the United States. And so, you know, there are, there are kidnappings and extortions and, um, uh, you know, assaults, both sexual and physical um, that, that we witness um, over the course of this journey. And so it's best that the children don't have to make that journey. And the danger of that journey is one of the main reasons why we're hearing reports of so many coyotes is, is that many of these coyotes are hired to keep the children safe, um, you know, from the cartels and, and gangs that uh, control parts of this journey. Um, and so some of the reasons that the kids are coming to the United States is that um, first and foremost, I want to emphasize that approximately 89% of these children have family in the United States. And that's the thing that we discovered again and again, both as we were interviewing the children and as we were looking at the statistics that were being recorded by the U.S. government. And so one is that they have people whom they love and they trust in the United States who um, want to care for them, are able to care for them. And um, in addition to that, they have a relationship to the United States, you know, through the family relations, they are wrestling with, with gangs and criminal cartels. We're seeing the effects of the climate crisis with hurricanes and droughts and, and other ecological disasters that particularly with the rise of COVID has made it hard for many of these children to um, be supported and to uh, be able to escape poverty in their home country. Some of them, their homes have been destroyed by climate crisis disasters and other cases 
um, it, it has destroyed their, their family's ability to support them. And so they are trying to wrestle with multiple issues in their home countries. In addition to that, we hear uh, about frequent instances of sexual abuse. We hear this especially reported from the girl children who are targeted by the gangs and the cartels and uh, forced to um, become essentially sex slaves to uh, cartel members or, or gang members. And if they don't, then some of the girls report um, you know, uh, threats and actual instances of, of gang rape and, um, and, and of violence. Um, and, and sometimes sisters and other relatives are killed if they don't cooperate. We hear a lot of reports about misogyny and domestic violence and of course, corruption. Um, and so these are some of the reasons that the children give when we interview them about what brought them to the United States. Um, many of the children arrive with family and then are routinely separated by their family members, including parents. Um, once they arrive in the United States, um, historically, children were not separated from parents, except for if the parent was a felon, a known felon, or if the child appeared to be abused or neglected and not the type of the level of neglect that might occur, you know, during this very dangerous overland journey, but, you know, a more um, the sustained form of severe neglect that indicated that the parents could not take care of them. And so um, they, they come to the United States often with their families, um, sometimes on their own. And then, like I say, some of them are actually separated, which can be very traumatic for the child. And that's in fact what we found when we arrived at the Clint Border Patrol facility in June, 2019. When we arrived at this facility, um, we expected to see few, if any, children here. And in fact, um, when we walked in, we were handed a uh, roster of uh, over 350 children who uh, we went on to discover were being kept in a warehouse, a loading dock, overcrowded jail cells and tents out in the desert. We couldn't really believe um, what we were witnessing um, when the children walked in and were absolutely filthy dirty. This was a, a border patrol facility that was relatively new. It was only supposed to house approximately 104 adult males. And the conditions that the children described were truly horrific, you know, with, with dozens, hundreds of children sleeping on concrete, um, not being given showers, um, you know, not being fed enough, um, children being, you know, taking care of other children. And we demanded to see where the children were being kept based on the stories that they told us. And the government authorities refused to let us inspect the facility, which they have the legal right to do, to you know, refuse our, our request for an inspection. And so after a full day of interviewing child after child who was in tears and just devastated by the trauma that they were being subjected to, we drove around the outside of the facility and we saw this building, which appeared to be a relatively newly constructed warehouse with almost no windows. You see that small ventilation window there. And it sounded like what the children were describing. And we drove back and forth and we took all these photos and I'm, I'm standing literally as the car is driving, you know, out the passenger window, taking pictures with my iPhone to try and document um, whether or not the children really could be kept here. And when we came in the next day, the, um, the government officials refused to confirm that that's in fact where the children were being kept. And so we asked one of the children the next day to draw a picture of where the children are being kept. And what we found is that the child's diagram matched the pictures that we had taken precisely. So for example, if you look over at the right side of this diagram, you'll see nine porta potties and um, and then over on the other side you'll see a couple of trailers and when we compared it to the pictures of my on my iPhone you literally can count nine porta potties um, on that same side of the warehouse and when we looked at what was on the other side of the warehouse and the photos on my iPhone you see a trailer where a medic was kept and then you also see a trailer that was that the children said was brought in a couple of days before our arrival that contained showers. And what the children said is that they were given no showers for days or weeks and that there were actually, we later learned over twice as many children there as we discovered in, in June and that they started to bust those children out 
sometime around the notification of, of our visit to this facility. And then they started to, according to the children's testimony, started to kind of rush the children through and let them take very quick showers before our arrival. But the fact is that they couldn't shower all the children. And so many of the children that we saw had matted hair and dirty clothes and had and literally not showered for, for weeks and were just in a desperate state of mind. Despite all this, um, as we practiced our trauma-informed interviewing, um, you know, we often give children crayons and paper and ask them where they're from and we ask them about their families and everything. And we found that these children, just with every single facility that we visited, are absolutely beautiful inside and out, that these are children who are filled with love and hope and intelligence and talent, um, that many of them continue to um, you know, have a, a hope for the future. And um, I'm always just so moved that when the children are drawing pictures as they're talking to us, that they draw pictures of their home, they draw pictures of their family, they draw pictures of hearts and flowers, of you know, the buses that they like to ride on because some, so many kids are just fascinated with transportation and that they might draw pictures of their home and talk about how they miss their home in the mountains back home. And so we, after four days, we kept going back to this facility. Um, the children were sick. There was widespread illness in the facility. There was a lice infestation. The children told us stories about being hit by some of the guards. They, every child that we spoke to was hungry. Um, they were not being fed real foods, adequate amounts of food. Um, they described, you know, when, when, one cell of children described a guard who had given them two lice cones to pass around. There were um, 40 something children in the cell and he, he gave them two lice cones to pass around. And um, that's one thing that you never do when there is a, a lice outbreak. And, and all of us, of course, know that Anne Frank, when she passed away, um, you know, in, in Nazi Germany, that it wasn't from the um, concentration camps. It wasn't from the death camps. It was actually from uh, typhus, which is a condition that is spread by, by lice. And so when we found out that these children were not only, um, you know, experiencing this lice infestation, but that it was being managed in such a way that it could spread the infestation. And then one of the combs was lost and the children reported that the guard came in and yelled at them and demanded that if they did not give back the lost comb, that he would make all the children, including the infants and toddlers, preschoolers, sleep on the concrete floor that night. And in fact, although there were always children who were sleeping on the concrete floor during the entire time that we were there, um, we came back the next day to see if he really followed through on the incredibly um, cold-hearted threat. And the, every child that we talked to from that cell confirmed that he in fact had come in um, taken away their bedding and made everybody sleep on the floor that night. And so we went to the children's attorneys who are litigating the case that got us um, into these facilities in the first place. It's the Flores v. Barr case, um, which is the class action suit on behalf of children who are in government custody when they arrive in the United States. And the attorneys immediately filed a motion for a temporary restraining order to halt these practices that literally were, um, you know, spreading disease and traumatizing their children. In addition to that, um, I and my students filed a, a filing a complaint with the uh, UN Human Rights Council, relying on the children's testimonies. Um, and I talked to the media, I talked to as many people in the media as I could to try and inform the US government or the, the US public. But what happened was the highest level of governments pushed back against our reports of what we had discovered. And they tried to say that this was fake news, that the children were well cared for, that we were making this up and, and basically called us liars. And I decided that what we really needed to do was to have the children speak for themselves and to make their testimonies accessible to the public. And yet, you know, I'm a lawyer. I don't know how to do that. I deal in black and white. And so we reached out to the public and we made the children's testimonies available online. And then we asked for people to use their creative talents to find ways to um, read the children's testimonies and bring them to life for the American public so that this becomes part of our culture and history. 
And so we had musicians, you know, like, like this woman, Christian Granger, who wrote The Gusta Babolito, and that was a semifinalist for the Grammy Awards um, this last year. We had um, a number of artists from around the world come together and create an art exhibit called Do You Know Where the Children Are? And this art exhibit was one mile from the White House, and every single uh, work of art was inspired by one or more testimonies of the children. We also had um, the comics community come together and create a comics book that was inspired by the children's testimonies and, and other stories at the, at the border. And then we had the Broadway community come together and do a series of readings of the children's testimonies um, you know, in, in their own words for anybody to just go online and watch this. We had the children's theater company in Chicago do an entire musical um, based upon the children's testimonies. And then, of course, um, you know, we, we had one incident where South Park did their first episode of the season about what had happened at, at Clint and showed just, you know, what um, a mockery it was of these children's humanity and their dignity. And one of the projects that um, I found, you know, to be just so transformative and powerful is the book that was published today. And that's the book, Hear My Voice, Escucha Mi Voice. And this book is taken entirely, other than the foreword and the back matter, entirely from the children in their own words. And it was really the um, Latinx illustrators like Juji Morales who brought this book into being, that there was the concept for the book, but nobody knew really how to create a children's book. And so members of our team reached out to the children's illustrators community and said, how do we write a children's book? How can we bring to life these children's words off these black and white pages that the attorneys have collected and entered into the, the court system? And um, all of these Latinx illustrators from across the country and even down in Mexico then basically organized themselves and invited one another to read the children's declarations and to create individualized portraits that were inspired that each illustrator was able to choose their page, their layout for the children's book and to illustrate it in their own way. This is the illustration that Judy Morales, of course, the award-winning children's book illustrator created um, for Hear My Voice. Um, you know, every page, every spread has a very different style because it's represented by a different illustrator. And, um, and it's really able to make the children's accounts accessible in a way that they never would be if it were just the, um, you know, the, the legal documents that, that I tend to file. You know, you can see um, this particular illustration really shows you the way in which our incarceration of these children, the militarization of their care at the border, um, you know, threatens to destroy their hope that they have when they come to the United States. That's why they come here is because they're full of hope. And yet these experiences of the barbed wire and being locked in cages, which they literally are in some of these facilities, it destroys that hope and, and arguably it destroys our country as well. So with that, I'm going to invite Juji to um, talk a little bit about how she became involved and what it was like to read the children's declarations. Well, when, when, when I got the, the text with all of the children's words, uh, I had been following the news. I've been learning about what is happening there. And, and like you say, Warren, then we hear all this news which, from, from a liar from a real liar, you know, saying, this is not true, this is not what is happening. Actually, the children are having a great time. It's like they are going to camp and they are being uh, given uh, 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 time to recreate, they are having meals, they are being clean. And, 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 and just realizing that what is happening under the curtains that they are placing um, is, is completely different. Uh, it was heartbroken. And I, I contacted some of the other illustrators that, that work along 
uh, we all, each of us contribute one image for the for the book. And what they are saying is that one of the most difficult things is what you mentioned before is like how do you make a children's book out of this story, right? Yeah. And um, and, and I, I wonder like if you thought about that too, when you were trying to pick a narrative, how do, how do you make a story that is not only gonna make the public feel something, but that is gonna make the public do something about this. Um, and my, my, my colleagues and other illustrators, some of them are sharing how difficult it was for them precisely to use their um, their abilities and what they learned what to do when they illustrate for children and create something that does justice to the words of these children and how to balance one of them would say how do I balance the horrific things that these children are going through with the tenderness la ternura Mm -hmm. that these children represent. That was a really, really difficult part to do. Um, I'm going, I, I, I want to show a little bit also, like I have the book right here in front of me. And when, I, when we were given uh, um, the list of the, um, of the transcripts, like the, the words of the children, they were already divided in a scenes. And, and we were asked to be the ones to choose uh, which page we wanted to portray. And I have to tell you, it was so difficult work. It was absolutely difficult. I was reading every page and I was thinking, like, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this without my heart just being destroyed, without finding that, that it's, there seems to be no hope? We all know that we're the ones that work with children's books, we know that part of our work is precisely to give hope to our readers, to children, to the community, that there is something that can be done. That's why we make books, not to destroy the hopes of children, but to actually tell them that we are here for them yeah. and that they are not alone. And in this, in these books, we, we, with these books, we tell them that, that they are going to be doing okay, that here we are to take care of them. Why aren't we telling that to every child? Mm -hmm. Why are we telling that just to a few of our children? And then we have all these children in, um, in, in, in cages. Or we have them being separated from the family. So I was going to tell you that when I got to this, to this page, um, I, I was, I was going to choose. I was in the process of choosing what I was gonna, what, which was gonna be my page. And page after page, but especially, I think that one was one that I thought, I cannot do that. I just don't know how to do something like that. How can I portray such a um, vile words and, and such a destruction? How am I gonna, as an illustrator, as an artist, do a work that uses those words and those images and still not break someone else, not break a child. And I just have to say, you know, like my colleague, um, I think it was Bayo who made this, uh, this illustration, Bayo Flores and all of them. But, but when, I th when I see that image, I just, I, 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 I'm, I'm grateful to have been a part of this book and to be, had been in the company of all these illustrators, all these artists who were able to, to teach us something to mm -hmm. all of us. To me, they taught me something. I don't know how, how you feel about that. You know, when you saw the images that were made from the words of these children, how was that for you, Warren? Oh my gosh. So I was telling someone just this weekend that I remember exactly where I was sitting. I remember exactly what time of day it was. And I remember getting chills all over. And I have them right now, just thinking about that moment, because it was one of the most powerful books that I had ever seen. And my heart just poured forth because it was exactly what I was hoping 
when we reach out to you know the entire national community of, of artists and creative types and said help you know we need you let you know this is not something that can just be bought in the courtroom that this is something where we need for you to transform the social conscience because if we don't do that people will not know that these children really existed they might read that false narrative about you know, this never happened, these children don't exist, that they were treated beautifully, whatever the narrative was, but there were so many false narratives being um, promoted that we really needed for, for you and all of your colleagues to bring the children's stories to life, to amplify their voices through your artwork. And, and I really, to this day, gives me chills. Yeah. So we, we work in this book, we figure out how to do it. And it makes me go back to some of the things that you talk about, about what you witnessed, about how children were being, being treated. And I don't, do you, because I have that sense, I, I have that, 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 that feeling that things were orchestrated mm -hmm. so that the children yep. and, and the families were going to be deterred from coming through, from come, trying to come in and enter to the United States. So how do you counteract something like that? That was a really well-planned uh, action. So how do you counteract something like that? I, you know, I honestly, I, I was raised in a family of faith and we have been taught that things happen for a reason and that we must put ourselves into the universe and trust that, you know, God or the universe, whatever it is that you want to call it, will use us for the greater good if we allow ourselves to. And I, I really do believe that you and I and everybody else who's been involved in this project are, you know, working for a higher purpose in trying to amplify the voices because it feels very much like there's a struggle right now between good and evil. And, um, and these children are being sacrificed in that battle. And, you know, we need to do everything that we can. I, I don't know how much you know about zebras, but um, zebras, when a predator uh, is, uh, you know, is seen or arrives near a herd, all of the adult zebras circle around the young in order to protect their young. And I feel very much that this is what we're being called to do, um, you know, both in the United States and in other countries that are wrestling with these issues of migration and, and you know, and, and witnessing the mistreatment of children in the, in the process in that migration experience, that it's, it's our responsibility as the adults to protect them from the predators who will do them harm, including uh, dishonorable governments who will lie about the children's existence, will lie about the facilities and you know the, how many beds are available and you know how quickly they're processing the children and how the children are being kept. I mean, all of these things were lied about, and um, you know, and we very much I think need to reach out to one another and say I need help. And Project Amplify was very much a cry for help. It's an almost entirely volunteer effort. And as you saw from the slideshow, you know, we, we had your group of children's book illustrators come forward. We had, you know, the artists come forward. We had the Broadway performers come forward. And it was so beautiful to see the human spirit that is moved with compassion. And then when you combine that, com that compassion with creativity, you have the ability to change the course of history. And that's what I think is the path that we're on today is trying to change you know, the policies at the border, border management policies and practices. So when children arrive to the United States, they are no longer being abused. They are no longer being systematically neglected. They are hopefully will be uh, received in child appropriate facilities, identified, including figuring out where their family is or other loved ones in the United States, because of course, 89% of the children have family and loved ones in the United States, and then reunifying them with their families as quickly as possible. And, uh, you know, while the courts determine if there's a legal basis for the children to stay here, and for those children that, uh, you know, are not able to stay in the United States, they too deserve to be treated humanely. Um, you know, as we process them quickly and, and treat them like the children they are and then get them back home safely to their families, you know, in their countries of origin. But it's all about, you know, treating the children with dignity and respect, regardless of who they are. Or maybe you have also have people that tell you, well, Trump is gone. 
You know, now we have a new president. Now there is no anymore that idea that this government is gonna build a wall. Now things are different and we, sh we, we, we can move on now, you know, and go and, and check other things that are happening right now because the children, uh, they are not uh, inside cages anymore. Uh, what do you say to that? Tell us, because a lot of us don't, we, we believe that that is true. So Gigi, I, um, I'm a volunteer civics teacher at a local school here in my community in Salem, Oregon. And I took some of my civics students to a Trump rally when he was running for president in 2016. And I watched that candidate interact with the public and in watching that rally and how he reacted to what the crowd would do in response to the things that he said or didn't say, I came to understand that the evil is not in President Trump, it's in ourselves, it's in our community, it's in our population, and that we need to find ways to bring the best out of one another, and that we can't try and, you know, limit this to, oh, there was a, you know, evil president, and now that he's gone, we're going to be fine. He brought out the worst in us, and we, I presume, brought out the worst in him, but the bottom line is that this evil is very much within us as a society, and it's important for us to recognize that, confront it, and find ways to defeat it, you know, with goodness and compassion and humanity, in everything that we do. And I think that the work that you did with this book and the contributions that you made helped to do that. They helped to give us the hope that we need to, to move forward from this very dark point in history that we're not out of and that we may never be out of. This might be a lifelong struggle that we face. Yeah, are their children still in detention? Oh yeah. I mean, and, and the thing is, is that, you know, I talked to, um, representatives of the Biden administration back back in December, and you know, and and I said that you cannot open the border too quickly because we had also been going to Mexico and interviewing the children and the families who were sent to Mexico by the U.S. government, even though the children had no family in Mexico, no, you know, their the, the, their their parents had no jobs in Mexico. Some of them didn't even speak Spanish, but we knew that there were tens of thousands of people who were waiting to come into the United States and that the um, this bottleneck that we're now witnessing now that everyone's like, oh, it's a surge, it's a crisis. It's like, you should have called me in December. I told you then what was gonna happen when we started to do this. And, you know, and in addition to the bottleneck, you know, some of this is because of the climate, um, you know, crisis uh, catastrophes that we saw this last fall in Guatemala and the Northern Triangle. Part of it's that combined with COVID. Um, but the bottom line is, is that we're still not setting up the infrastructure that we need to change, to adapt to the changing demographics of who's coming to the United States, that we have to understand that, uh, uh, you know, half or more, you know, it, uh, will be children and that you don't process children in a way that you would, um, you know, a, an adult. It's like, these are very different circumstances. These are children who are coming here. Uh, many of them looking for asylum and almost all of them with family waiting for them on this side of the border. Yeah, you know what I what I realize often how uh, the, the, the real Im immigration policies and the real walls that are still being built are not necessarily those, the infrastructure or, or even the, the policies. But they are the way that we see the people that tries to cross the border and how we see those children. I was reading a report. Um, I don't remember uh, uh, where it came from uh, right now, but this was something that, that was equipping. Um, it was trying to show what happens when we don't see a, a whole picture. You know, yeah. and, and, and it was giving the example, like what will happen if you see through a narrow opening through curtains and you see that in front of, uh, in the house in the front, there is someone with a gun you know, and he's pointing at someone else. And, and, and then you, you get um, all flustered and you try to call 911, but then someone comes and pulls the curtains apart and you realize that this is um, 
a Halloween party or a costumes party and people are actually having fun. And they, um, they were saying that the way that we see uh, things like, like immigration, like children who are trying to cross the border is always such an incomplete view that we, that we only then use a frame and those frames are used to, uh, to encapsulate people mm -hmm. and their situations. And so then we might say that uh, immigrants or children who are trying to cross the border, well, they, they are, um, I don't know, they are gonna be workers. Like you see through the frame or being workers, through the frame or being aliens, through the frame or being um, people who are asking for amnesty. And when you use all of those incomplete views of people, yeah. then um, then you realize that you are afraid of them. You need to protect, protect from them because you are see them as objects or you are seeing them as, you see them as aliens, well, imagine like someone who comes from another planet, right? Right. And, well, we are humans. Well, all those children are humans. When you use uh, words, and, 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 and labels um, to see real humans, you are taking that humanity away. Yep. And to someone who is not human, you can do anything you want to, right? Yeah. You can deport them. You can make them disappear. You cannot uh, feed them or wash them or give them a right place to sleep. You mm -hmm. can separate them from your families. You can erase them. You can let them die because yeah. they are not humans. They are being portrayed as not humans. And I think that not only the past administration, but we still are dealing with those, with those lenses, with, with us not being able to see people in the conditions of immigration, for, ex for example, um, as the humans that they are, how just wholesome, beautiful, yeah, uh, valuable uh, human beings they are that are coming uh, to be along, you know, yeah. be my neighbor, be someone that I maybe a, a student, uh, someone who is gonna read our books, someone who is gonna contribute to the work that we are doing to make this world a, a better place. Yeah, there there is a saying in South Africa which is uh, Ubuntu. And it means that I become me through you. I become human through the way that I treat you with humanity. And the way that we interact with each other ends up defining who we are. And if you know we treat other people inhumanely, then we lose our humanity in the process. And so it's so important for us to remain relational to each other and treat one another with dignity and respect. Along those lines, why don't we invite our guests to join the conversation? So... Courtney, what do you think is the best way to, to do this? Do you want to share questions from the chat? Sure. We've got we've got some wonderful um, just some wonderful you know words of um, shared in the chat by our attendees, and then we've also asked our attendees to go to the Q and A button to post questions. Um, so uh, we've got lots of questions. Um, one, Warren is, and you touched on this, do you have any sense that things are better for the children at the border under the Biden administration? Um, so a couple of things. One is that the Biden administration is recognizing that the border management policies and procedures need to change. Um, that's very different than what we were witnessing under the Trump administration. Um, the Trump administration also said that the border management policies and procedures needed to, to change, but um, Stephen Miller issued a memo that, that basically says that um, the children needed to be treated as, as badly as possible um, in order to prevent, uh, you know, to, to deter immigration. And, and so there was literally policies and practices that appear to be uh, adopted specifically to traumatize children with the thinking that, oh, if we sacrifice a few children now, it'll keep the rest of the children you know, from coming to the United States. Um, the Biden administration is looking at changes of policies and practices at the border, um, but this system has been in operation in one form or another um, along this very punitive, very militaristic um, 
uh, approach for over a century now. And so it's a, about a century now. And, and so it's important to understand that it will take several years to adapt the system to a more child-centered system. And so we are seeing changes, but they're more changes with intent. Um, but we are seeing, for example, a concrete change is that the week before last, the Biden administration um, made some changes to processing in order to get children with extended family members, so not just parents, but extended family members more quickly. And so we could get them out of the um, convention centers and other facilities where we're being kept. But there's a very different intent and I'm hoping for long-term change. And you and you touched upon the the current situation at the border. Uh, Barbara had had asked this question. I think before you and Juji were talking about it. Um, but is, do you feel it's worse than what you've already described? Um, well, part of what was so horrific um, in in our circumstances is that over the course of, of my visits along the border, we were interviewing children who had been in government care, and I use that name knowing that it really wasn't care at all, um, for over nine months or over a year in some circumstances, and these children were being kept in, you know, there was uh, one facility that was in a former Walmart um, in, in southeastern Texas, and another facility that was a, an abandoned military base in Homestead, Florida and stuff, and, the, and these children were there for, for weeks and months over a year with hardly any contact with their family, and, and so where is Yes, you know, some of the conditions aren't going to change um, in the Border Patrol facilities, for example, the length of time that they're being kept there, I'm hopeful will change with the Biden administration trying to um, expedite the processing of the children so that they can be placed with their families here in the United States more quickly. And we have a question about about your work in the courts. Is it still ongoing for the conditions for children? If so, how, how is that going? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. Um, so the Flores case was brought in 1985 in order to um, try and protect children who were being kept by, at the time it was INS, the Immigration and Naturalization, um, uh, you know, uh, I forget what the S stands for, but in any event, you know, I, the service. Um, and so they were being kept by INS in these black box facilities um, across the South and some of the children were being strip searched and some of the children were being vaginally searched and they were being kept with unrelated adults. They were being kept in like abandoned motels with barbed wire around it and, and things like that and um, not being allowed to go to school or have any kind of recreation and such. And so this case was brought then and it was litigated all the way to the Supreme Court and back down again. And sometimes the courts would side with the children and sometimes they would side with the government until finally the government and the children's attorneys got together and the government said, okay, we'll agree to feed the children. We'll agree to give them drinking water. We'll agree to, if they get sick, to treat them medically. We'll agree to release them to their families as expeditiously as possible because the INS was not releasing the children to their families. They were trying to use the children as bait in these black box facilities. Um, and, and then what happened was the government was supposed to develop laws, you know, regulatory laws to uh, try and implement permanent changes. Um, in, in, at the border for the processing of children and the care for them. And no administration has since the late 1990s. And, and so now what, um, you know, what sends me to these facilities is that we're checking to see if Flores is still being um, respected. And, um, and as I've documented, it's, it's just not. And so with the Trump administration, there was no entertainment of really wholeheartedly abiding by floors and making sure that children in, in government care were well fed and, and given water and released to their families quickly and everything. Um, but, you know, I, I'm not at liberty to talk about, you know, what's happening with the Biden administration settlement um, talks, you know, with the children's attorneys, you know, but I will say that the, the public change that they're showing, I am hopeful will also be conveyed in, you know, their private efforts to establish long-term legal protections for these children. And um, one of the questions uh, Maria has asked, while um, children are detained, do, do they get some type of education? You know, um, so not really. Um, they're supposed to. You know, that's one of the things that um, Flores provides. Um, but, but what we see is that, you know, for example, I, I uh, did an inspection and interviewed children at the Tent City in Torneo, Texas, where 
um, thousands of children were being kept in tents out in the desert. And we went into the education tent, which was huge. And somebody had a bullhorn and they were shouting history lessons in English across this giant tent. The children couldn't hear the person. I couldn't hear the person. Many of the children don't yet speak English or if they do, a lot of times they don't speak it fluently yet. And, um, and it, it wasn't what I would call education at all. And a lot of times if the children have, they get no access to education in the border patrol facilities. And then when they're you know, released um, you know, to other facilities such as the overflow facilities, such as Homestead, the military base and, and Torneo, um, they might get a couple of hours a day at most, but it's really not what, you know, I'm a licensed teacher. That's not education. That is, yeah. That's that's not what we do. So, but they're they're supposed to be. And I just I just want to share this lovely comment from Jenny in the chat. Uh, she writes, Juji and all illustrators, thank you for the love and tenderness in your illustrations to the voices of our precious children. Warren, thank you for your work and for helping bring these truths to light. Thank you. Um, you know, we have, we do have a few more, we have a few more minutes and we do have a few more questions. Um, uh, Barbara has asked, do you have any ideas to the percentage of family members in the U.S., uh, percentage of family members in the U.S. that are legal immigrants or citizens? I'm not sure if I'm reading that correctly. Um, no, I, I don't. So one of the things that has supposed to happen historically is that ICE and ORR are supposed to bifurcate their databases. And so ORR is supposed to place children with family members in the United States very quickly um, and, and not look into their status or their history because family is more important than anything else. You know, that is supposed to be one of the American values that, that guides the placement of these children. And the family member status doesn't really impact the child's own claim for being in the United States. And, and so um, the children do, many of them do apply for uh, a legal basis to remain in the United States. And um, if the children have attorneys, they're much more likely to succeed um, in, in that process than without attorneys. I've seen some percentages as high as 90 something percent compared to with no attorneys, less than 10%. So it really is night and day. Um, you know, some studies place the children's claims, um, you know, as uh, overall uh, around close to half of children having a legal basis to be in the United States. But again, you know, some of the uh, surveys of the children in their cases indicates that when attorneys are involved, over 90% have a legal basis for being here. And like I said, most of them, almost 90% have family or other loved ones in the United States for being here. And so um, many of these children should be integrated into our society, at least while their legal cases are being heard. And for those who um, prevail in those claims, you know, then, then permanently, and we need to make sure that regardless of whether they stay here or they return to their own countries, we need to do everything we can to not traumatize them in that process. Juji, uh, Alex, our executive director of the CARL is, is here in tonight's program. And, and she writes, it's heartening to hear how children's book artists came together so quickly to create this beautiful and heartbreaking book. Is there anything else you'd like to see the children's book community do to support the children who are detained or to create wider change? I think that we need to share these stories. And even, even today, I don't think that we are here only to present a book. I think that Warren and I and all of us here are to present a situation that needs something to be done about. It's for us to realize that there are things that are happening that we cannot just go uh, go through without us uh, having much, you know, like only, oh, I feel so bad about this happening, that we need to be doing things. And I, as, as I was reading also the complete book, the printed book, which is being uh, published today, is out today. One of the things that, that I really appreciated was this writing and what I quickly just read, it says, although this is a children's book, we recommend that 
uh, thoughtful adults are on hand to help you on readers process what they are learning from these children's accounts. The book should be viewed as an opportunity to better understand human migration and children's rights. And I think that that's what we are gonna be doing when we present this book. One, we are gonna be modeling how we take the hands of children when, th when, when difficult things are around to explain or to live. That the, in this way, we model how we as adults are responsible for being present when children need us. That the children who are going and we're going through these horrific um, events, that they are not just gonna be uh, the, the price that we all learn, that we all pay for learning. You know, it's, it's not enough for us to feel like, oh, okay, well, now we are doing something and I'm a better human. And the, pre the price that we pay, especially as a country, as the United States that we are, is that that price is not those children. We need to do better for us to learn from what's happening here. We don't need these children to be suffering, to be dying and to be going through things like this. So as adults, I think that we, we must come up with way, ways of learning these things in ways that, that are loving, that are part of the community that we do together. Uh, because one of the things that is very important when we, when we look at this book is that this is not the effort of one single person because all by ourselves, we will not be able to do it. We are gonna have to do it with everybody. We need everybody's help. We need all of our voices here. And if I can uh, ask something from you, from anyone who is acquiring this book and is reading it to someone else, is that when you read it, when you share it with another child, with another adult, that you are part of how we accompany children who need us. We cannot just be the witnesses of this. We need to be the actors and we need to be there to make sure that these things don't happen ever again. And if maybe we are not gonna be able to go to the places where children are detained, we have to, to start at home and in our communities and in our families and in our neighborhoods and just model those ways of being together to protect children. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That there are so many questions in the Q and A, specifically asking, you know, what what can we do? Um, this has been uh, such such a, a powerful um, time to spend with both of you. Uh, for all of our attendees, thank you for joining us. And um, I, both my colleagues Sarah and I have shared in the chat, um, you know, information on purchasing Hear My Voice. The, the proceeds do benefit the incredible work of Project Amplify. Um, we've also included in the chat links to Project Amplify to follow them on Instagram uh, to keep, keep updated on their work. And Warren and Juji, thank you so much for, for sharing this incredible book with us. Thank you, everyone.